Okay, welcome everybody to Beekeeping Basics. Um, this is a Zoom webinar um, with Emily Bondor of the Santa Cruz Bee Company. And if we can go to the next slide, please. Sure. Um, some quick Zoom housekeeping for today. Um, you'll find that your microphone has been muted and your video is off. Um, we recommend you put it on speaker view if you can. And uh, if you have any comments or questions um, to the group or to us, um, just pop those in the, in the chat, excuse me. And um, there is a Q and A function for questions to the instructor. Uh, we're gonna answer those at the end. And once again, this is brought to you by the Center for, Center for Agroecology and the Friends of the Farm and Garden. Uh, my name is James. I'm one of the board members of the Farm and Garden, and we're super excited to host you all this evening virtually. Um, I'll add that there's going to be an in-person live beekeeping workshop that's going to be this Saturday as well. And um, we'll have links for signing up for that if you didn't know about it and would like to. Um, why don't we go to the next slide, please? So yeah, like I mentioned, um, this is brought to you by the Friends of the Farm and Garden. And if you would like to become a friend of the Farm and Garden, um, you would receive a 10% off discount at San Lorenzo Garden Center, Sierra Azul and the Garden Company. Uh, you also get 10% off workshops and events. And there are special invitations to members only uh, events that um, you would be able to have access to. Um, let me put the link in the chat for everybody. Uh, everyone. Okay, uh, next slide, please. All right. That might be it for me. Yeah, yeah. that's it for me. All right. Great workshop. Thank you. Thank you, James. All right, so handed over to me now. So my name is Emily. And for about six years now, I believe I've been running um, my little beekeeping business called the Santa Cruz Bee Company here locally in Santa Cruz. And I've been keeping bees for about nine years. And yeah, for a lot of that time, I've been sharing my experiences through teaching and really love the opportunity to get to do that. I started, when I started beekeeping, I was living on the island of Maui in Hawaii doing a farm permaculture apprenticeship program. And we had some beehives and a beekeeper that tended to them and started learning a little bit through him. And through that, he had a business raising queen bees and said, I need people to graft for me. And I was like, I thought that was something you did to fruit trees. Um, and then I learned that that was also a thing in beekeeping. So I started raising honeybee queens very early on and just thought, wow, this is so cool. Um, so really I've gotten very interested in um, working with honeybees in particular, um, not, not only teaching, but working on um, raising queens and kind of um, learning how to do queen rearing as well. And that's part of what I like to teach about. So our class today is very beginner. It, we're basically going to kind of talk about nuts and bolts of how to get started. And I'll talk about that on my agenda slide. So this is got what we're going to cover today in our workshop. So I'll talk a little bit about why we need pollinators. Then I'll talk about site selection for a beehive. Um, what kind of um, hive equipment and what style of hive you might need. Then I'll talk about the actual sourcing of the bees um, because it's not as simple as just buying the boxes. You need to also get the living beings and how do you do that? Uh, then I'm gonna talk a little bit um, about sort of early beginning hive management. Um, I'll just touch on some of the most important things to look for when you're first um, getting your bee colony established to sort of make sure that you're on the right track. And then I'll talk a little bit about what it takes for longer term care. And finally, I'll end with some recommended reading. So 
here's just a quote from the Purdue Extension, you know, very basic pollinators provide really important pollination services for not only managed cultivated crops, but wild, um, wild species of plants. And so in order to maintain genetic diversity in plants and make sure that we have adequate fruit and seed production for crops, wildflowers, shrubs, and trees, we need to have insect pollination and birds and bats. And um, there's a lot of different types of pollinators. So it's important to remember that today we're talking about honeybees. Honeybees are just one of many kinds of pollinators. Um, I feel that honeybees kind of get uh, the spotlight a lot. Um, there's also many benefits to honeybees aside from just the pollination services. Um, they provide honey and wax and things like that. So that's part of the human obsession with honeybees. <laughs> um, but very important for us to recognize the critical value that pollinators have in our landscape. So I think it's just important to have that context for uh, honeybees being one of many and pollinators being a critical, critical help to us. So there are a lot of ways that we could support pollinators by planting a garden and having a really nice landscape that we cultivate, not using pesticides, all of that sort of stuff. Um, of course, keeping honeybees, it's a really a, a very different skill set than just gardening or, you know, working to provide a good landscape for pollinators. So there's, um, you know, I have some different resources I can share with attendees about um, best species of plants to grow for pollinators in general and for honeybees, but today we're going to be talking more just of kind of the nuts and bolts of beekeeping itself. So kind of another little bit of an agenda slide. So site selection, sourcing equipment, managing uh, hives, keeping bees alive long term. So, you know, basically that's what we're going to cover. So here's a starting slide. Um, I like this picture because it kind of um, shows you better ideal site versus poor site. So um, you want to have your bees uh, set up in a situation that's going to be beneficial for them. So one thing that's not really covered in this picture, but that's really important is sunlight. So uh, I live in the redwoods and I help a lot of people that live in, in redwoods and in very shady areas. Um, honeybees really need to have sunlight, very similar to uh, how a lot of plants need good sunlight to grow well. Honeybees also need to have sunlight to thrive. So having them in an area where they're going to get a south southeastern exposure is ideal. That way the um, and the hive orientation is so that the entrance of the hive is facing southeast so they get the warm sun right first thing in the morning. Um, having them nearby to a water source, not right next to a water source, but um, within close range, because just like every other creature, bees need water. Um, you want them to be somewhere that's easily accessible. So this is more applicable if you are keeping colonies on farmland or on property that you don't own, um, or you know, if you live in town and you have a pretty small yard, that's going to be um, you know, they'll be easily accessible because they'll be right in your backyard or nearby. But if you're um, planning to keep colonies elsewhere, being able to, to drive relatively close to them, that is because if you're harvesting honey or splitting a hive or doing any one of these things where you might be carrying equipment, it can be heavy and bulky and awkward. Um, you also just have a lot of tools. You might have your, your bee suit and your smoker and your hive tool and uh, extra frames or equipment and it's good to have them accessible. Um, having the hive um, also in a situation where they're not sitting in cold stagnant air so like bottom of a cat bottom of a canyon or bottom of a valley uh, not only is it going to be shady but you might get kind of a cold sink there so having them elevated somewhere um, higher elevation so there's some airflow going through is great. Um, if you are keeping a hive in uh, an area where you do have a lot of neighbors nearby. I do think it's valuable and important to just maybe run it by neighbors and say, hey, I'm thinking about getting bees. And most people are really positive about it, but if anyone does have like an outrageous concern or knows that they're allergic or has really big um, you know, concerns about it, 
you know, that's something that you can address and, and figure out a way to um, maybe locate the hive on the opposite side of your property from them or something. So that'll be less intrusive for neighbors. Um, so here's a little pictogram also of a basic beehive setup. And this is what's called a Langstroth style hive. These are probably the beehives that you're most familiar with seeing. Um, these are the ones that are most often, you know, out in the fields for pollination. They're very user friendly and they have, it's a movable frame hive and it also has um, parts that are universal. Um, so it's, it's easy to um, expand and contract and, uh, you know, split hives and move frames around and they just, uh, they're very good for beginners in my opinion. Um, so, like I was saying, um, ideally you want your apiary setup to be, you know, easily accessible, good air drainage. Having a good hive stand is also important, and the next point is because of ants. Um, not always an issue. Um, typically, if you have a healthy bee colony, um, ants won't really be getting into it, but if you have some health problems in the hive, or they're weak, or there's some, some challenges there, um, that you will find that you may get an ant infestation in the hive. And so if you have um, a hive stand that has four legs, <laughs> single points of contact with the ground, um, there's some different types of um, ant traps, ant bait, and different things that you can use that are also non-toxic to the bees that can help um, curtail any kind of ant infestation. Um, like I was saying, having a water supply nearby is good and it can really just even be like a five gallon bucket with some wine corks floating in it or um, a rope hanging into it. You don't want to have it just be um, an open container of water with nothing for the bees to land on because they can, if their wings get wet, they can drown. So it's good for you, like if you put out a dish with some rocks. Um, some people have bird baths. If there's an edge that the bees can land on um, that's flatter, like some bird baths and things are, then it might be okay. But good to think about um, if it's like water in a five gallon bucket, that's gonna be a steep wall, slippery. You'd wanna put something in there for the bees to land on and, and drink off of. Um, having the water source right next to the hive is less ideal because the bees leave to defecate and urinate. And so if the water source is right next to the hive, they instinctively know that it may be contaminated. So better to put it about 15 feet or more away from where the hive is located. Um, and finally, having your equipment ready before the bees arrive. <laughs> if you order a package of bees, like I'll talk about what that means. Uh, and then you're like, oh, do I need to put these in something? <laughs> so kind of do your homework first to know what you need to get. Um, so recently I worked um, with some folks a couple years ago to get the city of Santa Cruz law changed around permitting for beehives. So there's no longer a permit requirement for the city of Santa Cruz. Um, Capitola, Watsonville, and Scotts Valley do have different bylaws and the county has different bylaws, but um, it's very rare that there are, is any kind of enforcement of permitting. So um, for the most part, it, it has been a non-issue for every beekeeper in the county that I know. So we don't really have an apiary inspector or anyone, you know, checking boxes. Um, the people that I know that have had challenges or issues, it's usually because a neighbor is annoyed that they have bees because they're pooping on their car or something like that. So um, usually those things can be worked out with neighbors. Um, like I was saying, still good especially um, not only for bee poop, which has been a legitimate complaint of people to me directly about bees, which I get. It looks like little drips of mustard on your car if you're ever wondering, seen those. Um, also good for um, if your bee colony swarms. This is also really important because if your bee colony swarms, you probably will want that swarm. <laughs> that's, that's your original queen mother leaving in that swarm. And so if your neighbor doesn't know that you keep bees, they might call the beekeepers guild or call someone like me to come and collect it. Um, so it's just good to kind of be aware of that. And then usually about a six foot setback gives you that bee line space. When the bees leave the hive, they don't fly directly out of the hive, they'll fly out and then up and around. Um, so but about a six foot setback is fine for in terms of like laying out your yard and your garden and trying to figure out, you know, oh, I want to be able to walk in this path without walking through the bees flight path. 
Okay, so here are a few more styles of beehives. So this one over here, like I talked about, is that vertical stacking Langstroth hive. It's named after a guy named Lorenzo Langstroth, hence the strange name <laughs> of the hive. Um, this is called a top bar hive, and this is a horizontal beehive. And it's called a top bar hive because it just has wooden slats, wooden bars that go across here. And then the bees build all of their own comb down in this space. So the benefit of this beehive is that you don't have the heavy lifting involved with these. Bees tend to store their honey above the brood nest. And so this box, especially one of these 10 frame deep Langstroth style boxes can be well over hundred pounds when it's full of honey or thereabouts, um, which I know I don't want to lift. <laughs> So um, this is great for older beekeepers or if you have back troubles, anything. The, set, the, the um, drawback with the top bar hive is that you can only expand it to this capacity. You can't add additional supers on top of it. So I do find that you get more swarming with top bar hives because they run out of space. This is a beehive called a Ware hive. And these ones, rather than usually with Langstroth hives, you add boxes above. With Ware hives, you tend to add boxes below or you'll do something called under supering. I find that these styles of hives are, they're not ideal for me because I'm often working alone or you know, sometimes with one other person, but um, you absolutely have to have two people because one person has to lift this while another person adds the box below. So. For me, I find that they're not ideal, um, but they are kind of a cool style of hive. These are sort of a hybrid between the two because they typically have top bars and then no sides or bottoms, like the way that a Langstroth hive has frames that have four sides. So they encourage more natural comb building um, and they have a different sort of ventilation system on the roof. Um, so one thing to note is that these Langstroth style hives, um, they pretty much always came in the 10 frame dimension. And then I think, I don't know, 20, 30 years ago, something, they started making a narrower version that's just an eight frame size box. And um, another thing to note is that like I was talking about supering hives, this here shows three boxes that are all the same dimensions. These are all what are, what are called deep, deep boxes and that um, also called a brood chamber. And these are nine and five eighths inches tall. You can also get medium honey supers that are shorter. Those are six and five eighths inches tall. The benefit there being that if they're a little bit shorter, they're a little bit lighter. So they're better for honey in that way. Um, but really important to note that eight and 10 frame dimensions. So when you're buying equipment, just don't, don't mix and match, get all of one kind or the other. <laughs> So the Langstroth style hives that I showed, those, here's a frame. So you can see for your understanding the four sides. And typically those hives are gonna have um, a foundation is most common. So this is a wax foundation. It's a pressed thin sheet of beeswax and it has vertical crimp wires that help to hold it in place so that it doesn't bend or melt one way or the other in a hive. Um, so the benefit of using plastic or wax foundation is that it gives you this imprinted cell size for a worker bee. And if you let the bees build their own comb, like you can see they're doing here, they don't always love to build on your uh, beautiful foundation that you give them. And you might be able to sort of see here that these are also slightly larger cells. So these are what are called drone cells. And the drones are the male bees that the colony likes to raise seasonally within the hive. And so uh, sometimes you run into challenges there. But if you give a lot of empty space, sometimes the bees will pilt a lot of this drone comb. And there are a lot of beekeepers that don't like that for a few reasons. So here's some pictures of plastic foundation. It's usually yellow. These are both pictures of black foundation. Um, the black, plastic foundation, um, it's really, it's very easy to um, put into the frames. The wax foundation is a little bit more um, involved to install it. You have to have a special kind of frame that has a little 
uh, wooden piece that pops off so you can secure it in place and then you need to nail it or staple it together and it um, takes a little more doing. The plastic foundation is very easy to pop into the frames. Luckily for me, it's very easy to also pop out of the frames because I am a foundationless beekeeper primarily, which means that I let the bees build their own wax. Um, I find that this is a much better situation for the bees because then they can not do this as much because <laughs> they can choose which size cell they want to build. And in the spring, they want to build more of the drone cells for uh, reproductive reasons. The, the drone bees, the male bees are the ones that are going to mate with your new queens every season when you have swarms. And uh, it's really beneficial to be able to get some of those uh, genes out into the environment. Bees mate openly, so they mate out in the air, in the wild, <laughs> on the wing, as they say. So if you can encourage some of that, um, it can also help increase genetic diversity in your area, which I find to be a valuable thing. So there are reasons that beekeepers don't like to raise a lot of drones because they are not worker bees. They don't forage, they don't collect nectar and pollen, so they're not going to help you with your honey crop. They don't build wax, they don't clean the hive. Their, their sole purpose is mating to you know, fertilize a queen bee. So very, very important role, but very short lived and seasonal role. So they also only live in the hive for part of the year and then the worker bees will kick them out. Uh, there are some reasons that beekeepers also like to limit drone production in hives because they uh, encourage uh, increase of this parasitic mite that honeybees have called the varroa mite, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, and the drone cell is larger and a little bit longer gestation. So the, the mites tend to build up in those drone cells a little bit if gone unchecked. So here I've got our, um, this is a foundationless beekeeping. So here uh, in this, this was a swarm that we caught up in Napa and this is a nuke box, a nucleus hive I'll talk about in a moment. And it's supposed to have five frames for a Langstroth hive in it. And it only has two, as you can see here, which were between here and, and here. And so it was a swarm that was collected and then left for you know probably a week or two or three. And then you see here that the bees have gone and built their own wax very lovingly. I think this is worker sized comb and this is drone sized comb. And so left unchecked, the bees will do all this sort of wonderful and crazy comb building, uh, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, but it can be really messy. And it's just, uh, this is, you know, why I don't recommend jumping into foundationless beekeeping for brand new beekeepers, because these things can, it can get messy quick and it can be hard to know how to clean up some of these problems. <laughs> so in short, uh, foundation is really beneficial for new beekeepers. I think it's also great for beekeepers to kind of get a newer beekeepers to get a little bit of experience practicing using a few frames without foundation because it's really cool also to see how the build, the bees are able to build their own wax so seamlessly. Um, and I think it's nice to give them agency over what cell size they want to build because uh, it's really good for them to have drones. So here you can see that that was when it went wrong, <laughs> but here's when it goes right. So here is a great example of the drone sized cells and the worker sized cells. And it's really kind of amazing. It's just like 50, 50 on this frame. A lot of times they'll kind of uh, drift in and out of a larger cell to a smaller cell, but I just love that this was basically right down the middle. <laughs> uh, there's a couple, few cells up here that are larger. Um, and then here is a frame, this is over at my apiary, the homeless garden project. Here we have uh, an older piece of wax comb that the bees kind of started uh, breaking down and recycling in the hive. And so uh, there was a little bit of old comb on a frame that I gave them. And then there was this negative space and you can see they just built brand new comb <laughs> attached right to it. And I love that too, because it's, you know, the yin and yang, black and white of <laughs> brand new wax is clear, it's white, and then uh, it starts to turn yellow as they put nectar and honey in it, and then as they put pollen in it, it turns sort of orangey, 
And once they start putting brood in it, it turns a light toasty brown until you basically get to comb like this that looks almost black. So the, the wax is basically a living tissue in the hive and has its own sort of life cycle that you can read in the color of the comb and the, and the quality of the comb. So also a really nice way to uh, get to experiment with that. And, and I just love the organic shapes that the bees build. I find them really beautiful and fascinating. All right, so here's my toolkit <laughs> for when I work in a hive. I do not wear gloves and I don't wear much protection. I'll wear a bee veil because I like to keep them off of my scalp and face. But uh, the gloves that you use in beekeeping, while protective, which is nice to not get stung on your hands, the bees can sting through pretty much everything except leather. Um, so they're really bulky and I find them very hard to work in. I end up crushing bees and it, it, you, they really limit your dexterity. So it's helpful to learn, I think, how to handle frames and how to work with, with bees without gloves because um, honeybees are quite docile. They really aren't interested in stinging unless provoked or trying to really protect the hive. And so if you... Uh, get some practice doing that, you'll, you'll sort of find over time that it's a bit, I think it's much easier to work without gloves. Um, hive tool, this is your little pry bar. I like this one that has the hook on the end because I find it really useful to um, use it as like a pivot fulcrum to get the frame out of the hive. Um, the bees make a substance called propolis, which is essentially glue <laughs> in the hive. And it's incredibly strong and sticky stuff that is you know they use it as a tool to seal gaps and holes and to secure things in place um, and it's highly beneficial because you can have a you know gusts of wind or an earthquake and your hive stays together um, but it means that you absolutely have to have a pry bar when you're working um, the bee smoker is pretty helpful i don't use it all the time but when i'm working in a really big colony that has a lot of bees in it it, it is really useful to try to prevent death of bees. Um, they will kind of cover a lot of surfaces. And if you're lifting off the, especially in the Langstroth style hives, you're, you lift off a box to look at the brood. And then when you go to put that honey super back, the bees are all around the edges of the box. And so if you just put it back, you'll squish a whole bunch of bees. So you smoke the edges and that gets the bees to go down into the hive. The idea behind smoke is uh, essentially, it was always thought that it distracted the bees and it essentially was sort of an evolutionary tactic where bees evolved living in trees. And so if they smelled smoke, they might think, oh, my house is gonna burn down. Let me fuel up on all this nectar. So it, it, the smoke gets them to eat nectar. And so part of the thinking there was, let me fuel up on nectar because that's gonna fuel my foraging flight. The bees eat eat nectar to um, build wax as well. So if they consume a lot of nectar, it'll fuel their, it's a carbohydrate to fuel their foraging flights or their, their exiting flights to find a new home. And then they have wax to build when they get there. I just read yesterday, another uh, theory behind the smoke is actually that in wildfires, the bees will consume a lot of the nectar in their home because there might be a very long time before there's going to be flowering plants again. So that's another really interesting uh, thing that I hadn't thought of before, but it, it does make sense to me. Okay, so that's a little bit about your tools. It's also, I use one of these blow torches um, to light my smoker, and I also use it to clean off my hive tool between every hive I'm in, and I use it to um, clean off scorching and scraping old, um, you know, if I have a, a box that was used on a previous beehive and I'm going to use it on a new one, I like to try to disinfect it as best as possible and just kind of clean it up. You may have a lot of propolis and wax and stuff left behind, so it's very helpful for that. Um, however, if you're just a backyard beekeeper with one hive, you can also totally just use a long nose lighter to light your bee smoker, so you don't need to have the blowtorch, but it is kind of fun to have one. Okay. <clears throat> so here's a little bit about equipment. So these are kind of my go-to suppliers. Um, Man Lake and Daydant are both online bee equipment suppliers. Um, they have brick and mortar places. I think Man Lake has a place in 
Woodland, California, kind of near Davis. Didn't, I'm not sure where their locations are, but regardless, everybody shops online now anyways. <laughs> um, both of those companies have, if you order more than $100 worth of stuff, you get free shipping, which is great because people just expect free shipping now with Amazon. <laughs> You'll notice Amazon is not on this list because I think better to not support them if you can avoid it. <laughs> um, my favorite of all is Mountain Feed and Farm Supply in Ben Lomond because they're local and they also sell bee equipment. I think they source their equipment from Man Lake. So, you know, you're not getting different equipment, but you are getting to support local. The benefit of Mountain Feed is that they also have some beekeepers on staff to help answer questions and they usually provide nu nucleus colonies every year as well. I'm not sure if they still have any available this year, but you could call them and ask. Um, <clears throat> and I'll explain what a nuke is in a minute. <laughs> um, so here's our um, equipment suppliers. And then there's some other smaller ones like Better Bee and Blue Sky Bee Supply. There's a lot of uh, a lot of places you can buy the equipment and it's you know not gonna be vastly different depending on where you get it. Um, but you know, I say if you can shop not on Amazon, that's great. Okay, good. I'm more or less on time for <laughs> where I wanted to be in the presentation by 530. So uh, this is sort of the second half of our talk. And what I'm going to be discussing today or, you know, for the rest of this <laughs> is about, uh, so I've got my bee boxes, I figured out my place that I want my hive, and I've got my, my hive tool and I'm, I'm ready to go. So what do I do now? Where do I get bees? What do I do? So there's four, this is sort of my idea and list of like what I see as the four different types of starter hives. Um, so package bees, I'll have a slide on that. Nucleus colony, those first two, basically are, you're going to be purchasing from a beekeeper, bee supplier, typically gonna be ordering those and they're gonna be a set price of somewhere between 150 and 250 dollars thereabouts. Um, the third option, uh, I could teach an entire class on that and I'm actually in my last, I also teach some beekeeping classes at Cabrillo College and I had a student recently that said, can you just explain how to do a split in one of my basic classes? And I was like, I should probably have a whole class on this because there's a lot of ways to do it. It's kind of like a you know, there's more than one way to raise a queen. There's there's more than one way to split a hive. So um, I'll talk a little bit, touch on that, but that's a whole topic that could be a whole class on its own. <laughs> and then uh, I'll also talk about swarms, which are an exciting uh, natural reproductive process of honeybees. All right, so here's what a package of bees looks like. It's essentially bulk bees in a box and it's a whole bunch of worker bees and maybe a few drones. And those are unrelated to the queen that is in that package. So that queen is usually raised, remember at the beginning when I was talking about grafting? <laughs> so there's this process of sort of uh, manufacturing, <laughs> of raising um, a number of queen bees called grafting. And then there's a whole process for um, queen rearing operations that, that do this. And so a lot of these bigger commercial beekeepers that raise package bees, they will uh, raise all of their queens and have their naturally mated queens. And then they will take a queen and put her in a cage with some attendant worker bees from the colony that she's from. And then they'll put her with a little, you know, twist tie kind of thing into um, that package box full of those bulk bees. So the bees that are in that package are not the daughters of that queen. They're unrelated to that queen. And so that's part of the reason that she's in that cage is they need to get used to her. They need to get acclimated to her pheromone because when bees, uh, when worker bees just come into contact with a queen that it doesn't belong to them, that they're not familiar with, their instinct is want to, to want to attack her and to kill her because she's unfamiliar to them. So they need to go through a nice integration process. I kind of think of it as like, if you have two flocks of chickens that you need to kind of slowly um, incorporate them together, otherwise they'll fight. So kind of similar process there. Um, so these package bees, um, they're compatible with any style of beehive which is a huge benefit of them. So if you had a top bar hive or if you had a woven skep hive or if you had a 
an, a hollowed out log that you wanted to put bees into, or if you had, you know, my bee mentor in Napa used to do all weird things. He put a bunch of bees in a dollhouse one time that was clo enclosed observation hive. So if you have an observation beehive in a wall, there's all sorts of these kind of alternative styles of hives. Um, package bees are great for that because it, they are, they're not on built comb already. They're adaptable and can grow into whatever sort of space you put them in. Uh, you do have to feed them a lot though, because the wax combs, uh, it takes a half pound of honey to make an ounce of wax. So the bees need a ton of supplemental feed in order to, to build that wax. So you're gonna need to supplement them a lot more than another style of starter hive. Um, so benefit, you can use them with a lot of different hives, drawback, Queen and bees unrelated, so there can be some challenges in getting them to want to accept her. Usually you'll have to go in and release that queen um, and check in on her, check up on her uh, as you go. So that's a challenge there, but um, they're also a little bit less expensive than a nucleus colony. Um, so here's a picture of that queen cage. She usually has a, a plug of fondant, which is like a powdered sugar candy fudge that the bees will eat through. And usually there'll be a plastic cap on top of that too. So when you first put her in, you have that plastic cap so the bees can't eat through the candy too quickly. You usually want it to be about a three to five day process of integrating that queen. So maybe have the cage in there with the plug for two days and then it'll take them another two to three days maybe to eat through that candy. So here's your mated queen with her little retinue of worker bees antenating around her and getting her pheromone and they like her because they're not attacking her. They're not on top of her in this picture. Um, and that queen has a marking for the color for the year. Um, so here is a nucleus colony. So this is usually my kind of, uh, what I recommend to a lot of folks when they're starting out. I think that they're really easy um, because you're basically getting a miniature established bee colony. The main drawback to the nucleus colony is that it only is compatible with Langstroth style hives. So if you did want to have a top bar hive or another style of hive, it doesn't work. Um, however, the nucleus colony, you get it. It's a mated queen with all of her own brood that she laid. So she's got her whole family there. All the worker bees in there are related to her. Um, and it comes on five drawn frames of comb. So they've already done a lot of that building. And then the brood is in there as well as their food store. So their nectar and nectar and honey and the pollen, which is also called bee bread. So you're essentially getting brood and food resources and a queen that's already related to the bees and they're already fairly established. Um, whereas with the package, they have a lot of work to do to get to that point. You know, it's probably like a six week process at least for a package of bees to get to where a nucleus colony is. So you kind of get a head start a little bit on that. That being said, you can often source uh, package bees a little earlier in the year than a nucleus colony. The most nu like the nucleus colonies at Mountain Feed aren't gonna be available until the end of April and beginning of May. So it's a bit, it's usually kind of after spring because they sort of, it's just sort of the way it goes with a lot of the commercial breeders. Um, okay, so we talked about packages and nucleus colonies. Here, we're gonna talk a little bit about splitting a hive. So if you had a friend that was a beekeeper that had a really big healthy colony and you wanted to get into beekeeping, but maybe you were trying to save money or maybe you were really excited to learn or maybe they were really excited to learn and wanted to be generous and offer some of their bees to you. Um, if you or your, your beekeeper friend had a bee colony that had lived two, three years and seemed to be really healthy and doing really well, um, another uh, impetus or reason for wanting to maybe split that hive is that you think, oh, these this is really good stock. I really want to work with, you know, have ret retain these genetics. And so splitting a hive, you'd, you'd get to keep that. So a split on a hive is kind of similar to a nuke. Um, I think they're most easily done from one Langstroth hive to another. Um, I've tried doing them between top bar hives. And the, the cha another challenge I didn't talk about with the top bar hives is that there's not a standard schematic for building. 
So if you, you know, if you order them from a company and you're ordering five of them and you know that they're identical because they're manufactured, that's one thing. But a lot of, um, a lot of beekeepers like top bar hives because they can build them themselves. So they'll have building plans. And if you don't follow the same building plans for your hive and your friend's hive, you might put them together and the bars are different lengths or different, the combs are different depths or the angle of the you know, hexagon shape that the top bar usually is, is different. So there's all sorts of challenges there. So typically your split is most easily done from one length straw hive to another. Um, and so there's a lot, like I was saying earlier, there's a lot of different ways to do this. Um, and there's sometimes a lot of different reasons for doing this. Um, in, a, in my practice, I find that I'm often doing this uh, to try and prevent swarming and to try and get a break in the brood cycle for varroa mites, um, which is that parasitic mite I mentioned and I'll have some pictures of in a minute. Um, so different benefits to doing this. Uh, you're gonna learn a lot about bees <laughs> from doing a split. You're gonna learn about a lot about their biology and um, there's this term bee math because there's a lot of uh, little, increments that you're going to need to make sure you are paying attention to in terms of how long things are taking if you're trying to raise a queen yourself. So the easiest way to do a split is that you, just like how you got a package of bees from a bee supplier, you order just a mated queen. So instead of that whole three pound box of bees with the, the queen in the cage, you just get the queen in the cage, the mated queen with her attendants. And then you can just take some frames of brood and some frames of food stores and a bunch of bees and put them in like a little nucleus box, kind of like that one. So if you have a, a little mini box like that, you can take that from a beehive and then in the, in the hive that you took those resources from, you give them some new frames to draw out because usually you're splitting in the spring at the time of year where the bees are able to build a lot of wax pretty quickly. So that colony is not going to be missing out a lot from taking the, those resources from them excuse me, <clears throat> and then into your queenless split, you can just give that new queen bee. Alternatively, uh, if you wanted to change the genetics in the original hive, you could, you know, if you found the queen and put her in the split, then you could put the mated caged queen that you purchased in the original hive. Um, you know, doesn't matter hugely one way or the other, really. Um, and you can also do something called a walkaway split, which is just, uh, you basically take those resources and everything that they need to raise a queen, which would be uh, worker brood of all of your ages and particularly uh, worker brood that has some new eggs, those new fertilized female eggs have the potential to become a queen. And so that's that whole process, like I was talking earlier about grafting, uh, the food that female bee larvae are fed when they're, they first hatch from that egg until they get capped in a cell, there's about a, a six day period of time. And if that female larva is fed royal jelly the whole time, she'll become a queen. And so bees are actually able to really, bees are amazing at making queens <laughs> for themselves. So you can have them do that rather than buying a queen even. Um, and then if you buy a queen, you're not gonna keep that genetics. That's gonna be 100% new genetics for that future hive. If you're interested in, hey, this colony did super well, they're really good stock, we wanna, we wanna keep working with that survivor stock, then if you have them raise a queen, she's, she's gonna mate with new drones, so 50% of the genetics will be different, but you're gonna retain that queen line genetics, so that's gonna be really beneficial for you. Um, typically, I recommend having the help of an experienced beekeeper when you're doing a split because, uh, you know, it's great if you can find the queen and know where she is, or even if you don't, if you're trying to do a walkaway split, but you only give them, you know, frames of capped brood and older larva, and they don't have anything to build a queen cell with, you know, you have some things you need to sort of check off. So important to kind of be aware of that stuff. Um, another thing with splits, and again, I'm sort of getting ahead of myself, but I'm about to talk about swarms. So like I just said, how the bees are able to raise queens depending on what is fed very early on. 
if your colony that you have, say you have this big established colony and you are looking through it during your inspection and you find a whole bunch of queen cells, which I actually, I don't think I have any pictures of queen cells in this presentation, which is ridiculous. Um, but if you are seeing queen cells, you know that that colony is getting ready to swarm. You know that they're running out of room, they're sensing that it's spring and that there's abundant forage and they have room, you know, ability to reproduce. Uh, you know, they're, they're running out of space in the hive, all of these things, you know, kind of create a situation where the colony is like, yeah, let's do this, let's make a baby. <laughs> and so, especially if you're looking through your hive and you're seeing queen cells, you know that your colony is planning on swarming pretty soon that's a perfect time to split a hive, especially if you can find the original queen and take her in the split, because then you're able to have a situation where you may not lose that queen if they do swarm and they go, you know, 60 feet up in a redwood tree and you can't catch them. So it's great to have um, so many options with ways to do a split. So hopefully that makes sense. I know that's kind of a little bit advanced topic for a beginner class, but I think it's great to know about. Um, so finally, um, catching a swarm is sort of the last way in which uh, you can get some bees. And this is like a really cool opportunity if you're ever, if you've ever been in a swarm or gotten to witness one, it's, um, it's pretty cool. So it's the bee's natural form of reproduction. Um, and if you're trying to catch a swarm, you really, it's much easier if you're already a beekeeper because you need to have drawn comb. That's the best way to catch a swarm. So ideally you wanna have, I usually use, I have a bunch of those little temporary nuke boxes like you saw on the previous slide. I'll have those in my car this time of year with frames of drawn comb. So then if people call me, I already have what I need. <laughs> um, the drawn comb, has tons of residual scents and pheromones from the colony. It's got propolis, it's got wax. Uh, the bees have this amazing sense of smell so they can tell if there was a queen on those frames. They can tell if there's brood in those frames. So um, you wanna have some drawn comb. If you try to catch a swarm on brand new equipment you just bought from the store, it's not gonna smell like a beehive. Um, they wanna move into a furnished condo. <laughs> they wanna be able to have their queen start laying right away. So if you have drawn comb, she are, can start laying eggs right away. They can, they can regurgitate back out all that nectar they collected before the swarm to build that wax to fill in that uh, comb and, and do all of that. So they're going to get more of a head start if you can catch them on uh, frames of drawn comb. That's going to be best. And then the other thing that you just have to know with catching a swarm is that you really have to get all of the bees off of the branch or off of, you know, whatever, wherever the bees have landed that you're trying to get them from point A to point B, which point B being B for box, <laughs> your bee box, uh, you need to get the queen. If you don't get the queen, they're all just going to go back to wherever she is. So they're following her scent. And if they don't have her scent, they're not going to stick around. So again, they'll want to go into that bee box more if it's got the drawn combs in it and then once queen goes in they'll really stay so that's like that's how you you know attract them and lure them in and get them in there um, but you physically need to actually you need physically need to get the queen in there and you probably won't see her because there's a buttload of bees on that branch <laughs> and um you know it's hard to find a queen it's like a needle in a haystack when you're you know the queen bee's only a little bit larger than a worker bee um sometimes you get lucky and you find her and then you know if you're worried about them not sticking around you could put her in a cage or something like that but for the most part i haven't had a big problem with queens leaving swarms um so again can be really helpful to have an experienced beekeeper another thing that's really important with swarms is that you need to make a judgment call about being safe um swarms love to go up into crazy weird places. Um, one thing I don't talk about in this because it's not beginner is bee removals and you know the number of people that call me and say I have bees in my roof and I'm like okay well if you're trying to ask me to work on a ladder uh, three stories up that's probably not going to happen so you know you have to you have to make those calls about what you're comfortable with so if there are bees but they're 20 feet up a tree if you have an extension ladder please have someone foot the ladder for you at least because you don't wanna fall out of a tree or off a ladder and it's just not worth it. So 
you know, it's great to catch swarms. Um, and it's great to be adventurous and it's really fun, but um, you also, like I was saying, you have to get all the bees in your box. So if they're in a, if they're in a place that's just not really accessible to get all of them, um, that might be the, the scenario. So you have to, you have to figure out what's gonna work for you. All right, I've got a little video to share of, this is basically to show the bees, when, when the queen is in the box, the bees are gonna follow. So this is a little time-lapse video. Oops, sorry, my bad back here I tried it a minute ago there we go. so the bees are on that branch and you can see that they're starting to fly in and you can kind of almost see them like marching up the sides of the box and then uh, you can see them pretty much just kind of like pouring into the box so I could watch bees all day especially in time lapse so pretty clear there to see once you get the bulk of the bees in your swarm box, then if you are watching them and you're seeing more and more bees going into the box, that's a really good indication that you have your queen. Um, so stick around after you've caught your swarm. You also don't want to move them in the middle of the day if you are, you know, at someone's house. Leave them, leave the box until nightfall and all the bees should go into there and then you can safely plug, close the box, and then move it to where you want to put it. So early on after your hive installation, um, like I was saying with package bees, you're going to want to feed them. Uh, the feed, unfortunately, is a sugar syrup using white sugar. Using brown sugar, organic sugar, turbinado sugar, honey, molasses. Bees can't digest molasses. It gives them diarrhea. And you also don't want to feed honey from other that you bought at the store from other beehives if you don't know where it came from because there can be diseases in the honey that could impact your bees. So always best to just feed white white sugar syrup. That's going to help them be kind of like a construction material for building wax combs in the spring. Um, and you may feed them in the fall as well, a thicker concentration if they um, were a late installation or Unfortunately, we've had a lot of drought years, so sometimes the bees need some help in the fall, depending. Um, good to check on your queen. Very important, especially if you have a package or if you, you know, had a, a split. Um, you're really going to need to make sure that your queen is, is proven, is good to go. She's out. She's laying. You're going to want to check her, you know, pretty soon to make sure, like, with a package that they haven't killed her. <laughs> if you have a package of bees and they kill that queen, they don't have any brood, so there's no way for them to make a new queen at all. So you have to get a new queen. Um, in other situations, if a colony, you know, doesn't like their queen and they try to make a new one, circumstances are a little different. But good to check on your queen. Then also really important to do brood inspections. Check to consistently kind of check up on the the health and the progress of your queen and what her laying pattern is. Um, if you, especially with a, a split on a hive, if you're raising your own queen, you want to make sure that she was uh, properly developed and well mated. So you want to make sure that she's a good quality queen as well. And that's another important thing. There's a lot of queen issues in beekeeping um, kind of across the board, unfortunately. So queen quality, queen longevity, those are consistent long-term challenges with beekeeping right now. So that's a really big part of your kind of seasonal management and learning with beekeeping is um, learning what, you know, good, good pattern, good healthy brood looks like. And then um, colonies where the queen's maybe not laying very well um, or other health issues. Um, making sure your bees have enough space is really important, especially during spring, you know, it's amazing how quickly the bees are able to build up like between February, you know, late February and now, I'm like blown away by, you know, boxes that I was in in late February that were, you know, frames that had nothing in them. And now they're all full of capped honey. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, okay, we really need to give more space. So just, you know, seasonally, there's a lot of seasonality and changes in the beehive. So being aware of that kind of seasonal management piece and when to add space is important, um, especially if you're trying to prevent swarming, if you're in a really densely populated area, things like that. Um, Varroa mites, I'm going to talk about. I talk a lot about um, integrative pest management and dealing with mites and dealing with um, 
health issues in some other classes that I offer. So um, you can follow up with me if you want more information about those because I'm really just barely touching on those here, but that's a super important part of beekeeping now more than ever. Um, so really valuable. And then um, knowing, you know, if you're, if you have an untenably high <laughs> mite load that looks like the colony is sick or going to die, if you want to choose to do some uh, more conventional approach of you using um, a mite treatment to, to kill the mites if it seems like that's the only option you have or I'm, I'm a treatment free beekeeper so that's not really part of my calculus per se but uh, you know kind of figuring out and deciding uh, what you know you might be an organic gardener but if you have a one time really bad infestation of something you may decide um, to make an exception or things like that. So um, that's kind of up to personal choice for everyone. Um, okay, so here we have eggs. They look like a teeny tiny grain of rice. These are in your worker size cell, good pattern. You know, if you're seeing multiple eggs in a frame or things like that, that can be cause for concern. Then we've got teeny tiny larva. This is that stage at which, you know, right around here is where a, a larva would be grafted and could become a queen. So this is sort of your, your turning point. <laughs> these larva have already been switched from being fed royal jelly to being fed brood food. And these ones are much further along. So from egg, uh, and it's an egg for three days, then it is a larva for six days. On the ninth day, it's capped. And then at 21 days, that bee emerges from her cell. So kind of like a, a chrysalis cocoon. So the, this is our capped worker brood. Here we've got a pretty good brood pattern, um, pretty consistent. Um, you know, you have a few gaps and holes, but for the most part, it's pretty, pretty even, pretty solid. That's an indication that Queen is doing a good job laying. So here we've got our um, varroa mites. So they are large enough to see them on the bees, very much so. I mean, if you are older and don't have the best eyesight anymore, um, you know, taking pictures of things, taking pictures of your monitoring tray in a beehive or, uh, you know, taking pictures of brood or your bees and then kind of <laughs> zooming in with the iPhone really helps. To, to look at some stuff. So I'll, I'll do that with some folks. Um, but yes, they are indeed large enough. They're this ectoparasite. So they are on the outside of the bees and they uh, vector all of these different viruses that impact the bees. One of the most visually obvious signs of the mites is that they cause this deformed wing virus where the wings are one of the very last things to develop on the bee before she emerges from her cocoon. And so if she has the mites in the cell with her reproducing and eating her brood food as she's developing, they're robbing her nutrients before she's even born. And then if they are also spreading virus in the hive, that is when you're going to see um, this stunted growth. You can see her abdomen is short. It's a little shorter than her sister's. Um, her body size is stunted. Her wings are deformed. So those are the most obvious signs, but um, there are some other, you know, it's actually somewhere around the ballpark of like 30 different viruses that these mites vector, but um, the most visually obvious one to, for me to point out to folks is this deformed wing virus. And so you'll get uncapping of um, the cells that have the mites reproducing inside of them. The mites share that reproductive space with the bees. So in the spring, as you're, colonies are building up as they're raising more brood to have a peak population at peak nectar flow, you're also going to get peak mites. So it's really important to realize that uh, while everything looks beautiful, the mites are reproducing underneath that capped brood, just like I was showing here, you know, we so you always have some number of mites in the hive and it's kind of up to the colony, their uh, hygienic behavior and, and ability to kind of clear mites from the hive on their own, or if they have just kind of good immunity and good genetics in general, then sometimes they can have more mites and not be as impacted. But for the most part, um, those mites are going to 
often be a, a trouble in the hive. So it's really important to be aware of what they look like, how to monitor for them, what to be looking for, and uh, the timeline of when to know how, when to do things. Um, typically late summer, my birthday is August 15th, which is also the, the timeline that they give for <laughs> when to do a treatment. Um, so yeah, typically mid, mid August or so is when you're gonna have the most uh, prevalence of mites in your colony. And that's tied to uh, the kind of peak, the bell curve peak of when you have the most brood and then the queen isn't laying as much, but then you have this big, big population of mites. So um, that's when you start to also see a lot of colonies kind of crashing from not having as, uh, you know, if they're not doing very well, it becomes very obvious in, in late summer. So I talked about the monitoring tray. So you can have a this is a screened bottom board, which I highly recommend for people using Langstroth hives. You have this little tray that slips in under here. Here's one that's a metal one. They're usually like a plastic tray. Um, and you, you put your tray in there and then you can pull it out. It, you, often they have a grid, um, so you can do a count for mites. Um, but it's really helpful in uh, seeing what your mite drop is. Sometimes you can also see if there's living mites that are moving around on the tray. Um, it tells you a whole lot of other information about what's happening in the hive as well. So I find it totally invaluable to, to have that monitoring tray. Um, but very, it can be very helpful, especially if you are um, trying to do organic beekeeping and you want to do mite counts and, and you want to, you know, not use a treatment at all, be aware of your mites. Um, there's some other uh, testing. There's an alcohol wash test that you can do to get a more uh, accurate number as well on the on the mites. Um, but typically, you do just you want to be aware of uh, what the the kind of trends um, of mite loads in your colony. It's having this as kind of a data point or something to draw from, and then doing that in addition to inspecting your brood and looking at the health of the brood, the health of the bees to kind of know what you're dealing with because um, you know some bee colonies are able to tolerate a higher mite load and some bee colonies seem to not have as many mites as other colonies and so I think there's there's a lot you can learn there from using these integrative pest management tools in your hive. Here's just a few more really depressing pictures for you guys to see. <laughs> so uh, this is signs that your hive is not doing well when you have this perforated brood like this, when there's holes in it, when there's slumping, looks like melted, discolored sort of larva. You can see the mites on it, just looks like these nice little pearly white larva just started desiccating and melting in the hive. And then if you have stillborn bees that are you know, emerging dead on arrival with their tongues out, that's also an indication that they're not well. Um, here are those drone pupa, those drone cells I was talking about earlier. So you can actually see the mites really do like to infest that drone brood. And so um, some beekeepers, even as a, um, a mechanical treatment, a non-chemical treatment, they will actually put frames in the hive for the bees to build drone brood and then remove it so that they can use that as a way to clear mites from the hive without losing worker bees. Um, seems like a lot of wasted work to me, but. I also understand that it could be useful. Um, and then a couple more bees with wing deformity. Here's a poor little bee with a mite on her eye. It's just, you know, throw mites horrible. It's also really important to remember that it's kind of viewing it in the lens of what is uh, kind of the long-term picture. I'm, I'm more of a, what they call a Darwinian beekeeper. <laughs> so I'm saying survival of the fittest, which are the bees that are, you know, able to survive this parasite because the bees had a uh, mite called tropolalaps. They've had wax moth. They've had all sorts of different diseases. There's another mite, um, or sorry, yeah, there's another mite that um, is in Southeast Asia right now um, that it's probably only a matter of time before um, that one comes here. That, that one is the tropolalaps mite. It's not in the US yet, but I have many bee researcher friends that are like, yeah, we should probably learn how to deal with this because it's only a matter of time before it's here. So there's a lot of um, uh, limitations on the way that bees can be moved and shipped around now because previously there wasn't and that was how a lot of these uh, parasites showed up in different places. 
So um, just really important to be aware of the fact that bees are very resilient and they're able to um, develop sort of these epigenetic traits over time to figure out how to live with these parasites. But that's, you know, the mites aren't going anywhere. So I think rather than eradicating them with chemicals, <laughs> that's not gonna help the bees build any sort of natural defenses. So I think it's, um, you have to kind of look at it as a, you know, that integrated pest management approach is probably gonna be your best bet. Um, and I've worked with a few beekeepers that have used treatments over the years and I, it's pretty much identical loss rates. So in my mind, if you look at big picture, not on a colony by colony basis, but kind of big picture numbers, uh, it's not drastically different. So it's, it's kind of like the, it's sort of, to me, is sort of similar to the argument of conventional farmers where they're like, yeah, but it'll cost so much and it will lose so much and blah, blah, blah. And then you see these organic and regenerative farms that are rocking it and doing amazing production and have, you know, healthier, resilient environment because of biodiversity. And, you know, there's, I think it's really important to kind of uh, take the long view. So, uh, you know, parasites suck, but we're working on it. <laughs> so a little bit about seasonal management kind of wrap up here. So um, expanding the colony in spring, you might want to reduce it in fall um, to help them keep warm and snug for winter. Um, you may need to feed in the fall, like I talked about. Ideally, you won't have to, but important to kind of assess the colony um, visually on the frames to, to look and, and see what um, how much honey and nectar they have for winter. Also feeling the weight of the hive is hugely important because honey is very heavy. So that's going to tell you, oh, I can barely lift this hive. Okay, they're fine for winter. Oh my God, I can lift this hive with one hand. They really need to be fed. So you'll get a feel for that over time. Um, monitoring the hive entrance is very valuable. Um, the size of the hive entrance is important depending seasonally that can make a huge impact about whether your colony is being robbed or bullied by other bees. If you have multiple hives in an apiary, different things like that. Um, yellow jackets, other critters can be um, predatory later in the season. So there's different sort of seasonal pests. Um, I talked earlier about integrative pest management as well. Um, so just monitoring for you know, healthy versus unhealthy kind of learning, looking at, you know, looking at pictures, watching videos, reading books, all that kind of stuff, learning disease ID. In my other classes, I show a lot more pictures of what, giving descriptions of the actual uh, bacterial and fungal diseases that bees can get, which is a whole other thing, but, um, you know, all of that in time, but yeah, good, good to learn. So you guys are doing that now by being here. <laughs> so, um, one of the questions I get to of like, why are all the bees dying? And wh what was that colony collapse disorder thing? Did they figure that out? Um, the answer is sort of. The, the figuring out piece is basically they boiled it down to these four Ps, which are parasites, the varroa mite, pathogens, which are the viruses associated with varroa mites, pesticides, which we know what those are, and that also can kind of be uh, insecticides or miticides for killing mites in the hive. And poor nutrition is the last one. So if you're keeping bees in an environment, particularly like if you're doing migratory pollination contracts and your bees are only uh, getting almond nectar for four, four weeks and then they're only getting apple nectar for four weeks. And if they're not getting a good variety of food and they've got other stress, um, and then you know the the pesticides some of the some of the pesticides that are used are fungicides which the bees actually actually do like a lacto fermentation process in their their pollen and, and they have these enzymes in their food stores and if there are a lot of fungicides that can impact their ability to digest food so there's all sorts of things that are happening uh in the environment and then other you know aside from this too is uh the poor nutrition piece can also be habitat loss, um, loss of biodiversity through land development and things like that, including agriculture. I mean, agriculture is not good for the planet, really. Big, big ag. Um, so a little bit about kind of those, those. And okay, so beginning beekeeping advice. You guys are all doing number one because you're 
in this class. <laughs> um, number two and three kind of go together because you can find a mentor through your local beekeeping group. Um, I've got a, a link, I think, in a couple slides to the Santa Cruz Beekeepers Guild, which is a group that I've been a part of for a bunch of years. Um, and we've got monthly Zoom meetings and also monthly in-person meetings. Um, so that's really helpful to get to meet other people in your area and get a, get, a, get some bee buddies. <laughs> um, knowing the source of where your bees are coming from is helpful. Um, you don't have to. I find that it's really beneficial um, for me because I, I'm also just really interested in genetics. So I try to try to track that. Um, practicing that good neighbor beekeeping, like I was talking about with, you know, telling your neighbors if you're thinking about getting bees and then telling them in, you know, beginning of March, hey, you know, if you see a swarm, it's probably from my hive. So, you know, maybe you can call me if you see one and, <laughs> you know, uh, setting up your apiary for success we talked about in the beginning. So, um, you know, kind of ideal site conditions. Number seven is huge, particularly if you are nerdy and want to learn, which you guys probably are because you're in a class right now. Um, but you're going to learn a lot through taking notes. Um, and you're also, your future self will thank you as well. Because if you do something, and you see something and you don't write it down or don't make note of it, and then later on you're trying to remember, it turns out that taking notes uh, can be really good for trying to remember things, especially dates. Um, splitting hives if you're trying to keep track of like you know oh when did when did I do that split and did were there queen cells or were they raising a queen and then okay it's 16 days for a queen cell to emerge so and then it's another you know, 10 days or so for it to get mated and then you know that bee math is really helpful if you've got dates of things written down in your observations so that's huge um, but also just you know if you're doing that mite counts or mite washes or um, if you've got multiple colonies too, like it just, I can't say enough about actually being good about taking notes. And um, that's something that I think is very important. Um, and then if there's something you don't know what to do, the best thing to do is to just not do anything because the bees are much, much smarter than humans. <laughs> so they probably know what's going on. They're probably, there's probably a reason for what they're doing. Um, and, you know, if you, if you experiment and try different things and they don't work out, you know, you know, fail, failure stands for, you know, first incidents in learning. So, you know, that's how your, you know, your failures are going to be your lessons. Um, but I would hate for anyone to have that failure be, you know, the loss of a colony, but these things happen too. So, you know, don't beat yourself up if your bee colony dies. Um, another thing that I don't have on here, but that I do typically recommend to folks when they're getting bees, if they're thinking about getting bees, is to get two bee colonies to start with, because the loss rate is like 45% annually. And so if you get one hive, the likelihood that it might not be around next year is like 50-50. So I find that if you're putting in that initial investment of time and learning and everything, having two is added insurance, it's also going to be a second data point to learn from. So and then you'll have resources to share if you need to, if you know the bees are healthy and whatnot. But um, you're gonna be able to do more the more colonies you have. So if you have space for two, you know, putting them, spacing them a little further apart is ideal too, which I didn't talk about here with multiple colonies. But um, yeah, highly recommend that if if at all possible. If it's not possible, that's fine. I would say you know if you're if it's a difference between getting a beehive and not, you should you should start a beehive if you want to. But um, it's nice to have that added insurance. Um, okay, so I'll- Hey, Emily, wanted, uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, thank you. I want, well, I wanted to give you a break. Because, thank you. Just, just a um, <laughs> yeah. Because that was awesome, amazing content and so much information. Um, and there's a couple of questions. There's one in chat around mites, but there's also one in the Q&A and, um, this is a good time to invite people to chat those questions if they have them, um, or you could use the Q&A feature, either one. Um, we're gonna take a little bit of time to answer those questions. And then also in the chat is an evaluation form, um, which can help us like how we design the workshops and whatnot. Um, and I have one question that might 
kick off before I kind of navigate us through the questions in the chat and the Q&A, which is around, um, I remember at EcoFarm a couple of years ago, Paul Stamets gave this talk about how he had like solved or not solved, but has created like a food that can be used to like utilize fungi to fight veromites, something along those lines. And I was just curious if you've tried it, what your experience has been, does that work? Does it not? Like, is it, where, where do you kind of fall on, on that topic? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I got to see Paul Stamets give that talk or similar talk at the Sonoma County Beekeepers Guild a bunch of years ago and was super inspired by it. And I remember he was talking about this, this P-cumeric acid. I remembered that he said that was the thing that the bees were foraging. They were finding that when he was putting out his mycelial patches and, and the bees that were living in in tree cavities and living in decaying wood, they were getting this p-cumeric acid. And so he, I think he somehow, you know, synthesized that or isolated it. Um, the drawback is that to my knowledge, uh, it's not something that's commercially available. So I don't know if it's a, if he makes a product that you can buy, I haven't really looked into it, but folks have asked me about it. And um, I don't know of anyone that's, that's using anything that's, that's from, uh, host defense or whatever his company is. Right. Um, I do know that there are um, some different biodynamic blends that folks will feed to bees. Um, that's almost like a biodynamic BT that has, um, you know, chamomile and comfrey and different things like that. And um, I apologize if you can hear screaming children in the background. <laughs> um, so there's a uh, I do know that there's some folks that have made sort of these different uh, food blends that they fed to bees. Some even have like minute parts of essential oils and things like that. Um, personally, I haven't gotten to experiment yet with um, using any kind of like medicinal mushroom extracts. Um, it's something I'm really interested in because it, again, you know, I think better to not give bees any kind of input that they wouldn't have naturally. But I think that's uh, using something like a medicinal mushroom extract is much more appealing than uh, using, you know, formic acid or some kind of miticide or something to, to battle mites. Um, I also like the approach that it's more um, giving them like a nutritional supplement um, to hopefully help them kind of help with immunity rather than, you know, like a hardcore medicine that you're blasting at them um so i like the idea a lot and I'm, I'm kind of curious to experiment but um there's another product that i had a company send me some and i just haven't tried it yet because i'm <laughs> too busy with other things but there's another product um called pro dfm it's kind of like a it's like a probiotic for bees so there are mm. products out there that um that are being developed uh that seem to kind of take more of a holistic like probiotic, prebiotic, nutritional approach, um, rather than, you know, some of these other things. So I think, uh, the short answer is I haven't tried them because I think they're not really available. That's also to say that even if they were available, I don't know that I would make the time to try them because yeah. I, think that you know, ideally I'd rather give the bees no input at all. Um, but I like the idea of it moving more in, into a, a place of like wellness rather than like boosting their natural immunities exactly. and resiliencies and things yeah. like that. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, one of the questions that we have in the Q and A is um, what happens to the bees that the beekeeper doesn't treat for the bees that have mites? And that that's kind of both of the questions are around mites and kind of like, can you do anything before? Is there any preventative? Is it all after? And what happens if you don't do it? Yeah, so this is one of like the kind of big, uh, there's sort of some, some rifts in the beekeeping world because some, some beekeepers are like, it's kind of a spectrum and, and some beekeepers are like, you absolutely have to treat the bees or you're being negligent and you're horrible. And then there's other people that are like, you absolutely shouldn't treat bees because that's getting in the way of their natural selection and that's not good either. So, um, you know, it's kind of a spectrum. And I think, so essentially to answer the question of what happens with the bees that have mites and the beekeeper doesn't treat, um, often they die. However, 
one of the things that I'm always trying to reiterate to folks is a lot of times when folks go to using a treatment for mites, they're, they're doing it to a colony that's already too far gone. The colony's already sick. It has viruses. So I always try to reiterate and say, this treatment will kill mites. This treatment is not going to make these bees not sick. It's not going to get rid of the viruses that they have. So I think that's right. a really important distinction for people to understand. Um, and there are preventative measures that you can do. So that's part of the um, that monitoring tray under the hive doing, doing mite counts, like a 24 hour mite count to know your mite drop. And then similarly, there is um, an alcohol wash test. There's also a powdered sugar test, but the alcohol wash test, unfortunately it's fatal to the bees, but it's very accurate for um, getting your percentage of phoretic mites in the hive. And then you can do a calculation to know what your overall threshold is. And if it's like more than three mites per 100 bees, that's sort of the agreed upon treatment threshold. Um, one criticism there is that I've also heard that uh, those treatment thresholds are being published by the folks that make the treatments. <laughs> so mm. it's always a little hard to know. It's kind of like when you're, you know, receiving you know, funding from Monsanto or something like that. So right. it's always a little bit, um, well, you know, I take that with a grain of salt. Yeah. Um, but so it's important to know as well though, that uh, if, you're, if your bees are infested with mites, the, the kind of more pro treatment side of the beekeeping community likes to refer to those sick colonies as mite bombs, or sometimes they're called robber lures. And so if you have a colony that previously was doing fine and they were foraging and they collected a decent honey crop and you know they were they were doing all right and things were going pretty well and then they've just sort of been slowly dwindled and are diminishing and are just being kind of ravaged by mites and are, are not healthy um, that's going to mean that you're going to have higher um, not not higher attrition in the in your bee population so another really important way to kind of monitor your mite load is to monitor your bee population because if you don't have a good population of bees, there's probably a reason for that. And so if they're, you know, sick from varroa associated viruses, if they're, if they're so sick that they're not going to um, be able to raise the bees, um, the, the brood can't be born and, and get to its full lifespan, um, that's a really big piece. So it's really important to remember when you're monitoring for mites to monitor your, your bee population. And if your hive is dwindling and the numbers of bees in the hive is going down, um, that's gonna make them a lot more vulnerable to other bees coming in and robbing their food supply because they're not gonna be able to defend themselves. So if, if other bees in a colony, especially later in the season, that's another part that's really tied to this late summer, higher mite load issue in our area specifically, is that because we tend to have, a, you know, exacerbated by drought, these long, hot, dry summer and fall months where it's been a long time since we've had rain and, and things are really drying out. If there's not food available for the bees, there's gonna be increased robbing behavior because the bees are gonna be desperate for food. So that's an, a really important thing to realize is that um, the, bee, the sick bees in that colony that had been doing well uh, you need to make sure that you're aware of the health of them. And like, if they had a whole box of honey, maybe pull, you know, 80% of it and shrink them down and close their entrance down and, and be aware that they're maybe not doing so hot because that's going to spread a lot more mites and virus if they just get cleaned out of all their honey stores because other bees coming in to steal that food are gonna be interacting with the bees that are in that hive. They could be getting some mites jumping on them in that hive. They could be exposed to viruses and they're bringing that back to those hives. So that's a really important piece. Um, yeah. yeah, so basically shrinking your colony down and having a closer eye on it and just kind of like, um, unfortunately it's kind of like know when to hold them and know when to fold them. And it's mm -hmm. that's really hard to hear for people that have like a single bee colony. Um, but I think that's a really important piece of kind of like understanding that, um, you're not, you know, 
you're not beekeeping in a vacuum. You're you're impacting other bee colonies and other beekeepers around you. So that's part of kind of just like I was talking about good neighbor beekeeping with swarms. It's also important to kind of practice like responsible beekeeping around not letting those problems go unchecked because that's another reason why I think a lot of beekeepers that decide not to treat for mites for whatever reason um, that can negatively impact other beekeepers in their community and then that gives all beekeepers kind of like a bad rap or those that are not those that are doing the more natural approach to beekeeping which you can do it successfully but you need to be aware of what to look out for thank you i think that's a that's a great place to wrap with the like i mean the takeaway is like if you do a good job with observation and whatnot you will be able to tell when things start to go which will give you a better time to use the tools to to address it and to consider yourself kind of a steward of the whole colony um i wonder if i can ask you to move to our next slide here we've got a couple of wrap-up slides that sure, we yes share. absolutely um so friendly reminder that this saturday there's a hands-on with honeybees workshop um up at the farm and garden at ucsc you can learn more at uh, the website there, um, which we can link to in the chat as well. And um, upcoming, we have gopher control for home gardeners and small farmers, uh, hands-on for um, gopher trapping workshops and uh, a citrus short course, um, which will be virtual and in person. Um, let's go to the next one. All right, so here's just a little more info about me. Um, so you guys can keep in touch or you know, reach out when you have questions, whatnot. Um, Santa Cruz Bee Co is my Instagram and Facebook. Um, here's my cell phone number in case you want it, or you know, you guys can if you Google Santa Cruz Bee Company, it'll it'll pop up. So you should be able to find me. Um, and then just a little more. Thank you for attending. And then I've got some uh, follow-up resources. Here we go. So um, there's so many places to get the information. Um, the top two that are highlighted in yellow are favorite bee journals of mine. Um, they're both print and online. And I haven't uh, gotten a subscription to American Bee Journal recently, but I have a subscription to Bee Culture and it's like, it's like $12 for the whole year. It's like a dollar an issue or something crazy like that. So they must be losing money or I don't know what's going on, but it's crazy cheap. And it has really good articles written by people all over the place. Um, and I just, I like things that are published because they typically have like an editing and review board <laughs> where some stuff that you read online, you don't really know if it's just someone's opinion or what. Um, these several books um, are all just great kind of beginner books. Uh, Michael Bush has a blog called The Practical Beekeeper where he has a ton of information and I've seen him speak and he's really great. Um, he also regularly posts on this bee source forum. I've seen him on there. Um, this is super helpful. Like I was just using this the other day because I bought some queen bees and I was like splitting hives and thinking, oh, you know, do I add these queens today or tomorrow? And, you know, it's nice to kind of read different, you know, for as much that it is crowdsourced and not, you know, peer reviewed or edited, it's nice to just get people's different perspective of what's worked where. Um, this is another great blog that if I've gone to for, you know, individual questions that I've had that come up. Um, I don't have marked on here for whatever reason I forgot. <laughs> um, Dr. Thomas Seeley, I'm gonna put it in the chat too. He's truly amazing. He was the one that I just mentioned about the thinking that the smoke, the use of the smoke was because of uh, crops burning in wildfires and the bees not may not be able to eat again. Um, but he's the one that actually kind of um, coined the term Darwinian beekeeping and he's got this mm. whole, um, oh, yes. Let me make sure that's to everyone. Um, to everyone. Um, so he is the one, I highly recommend his books. Um, Honey Bee Democracy is one, oops, got that wrong, sorry. Um, he also uh, has a great article about Darwinian beekeeping that um, through the Natural Beekeeping Trust, you can find that. But um, 
he's, I just like, he's a huge inspiration for me and many beekeepers um, about kind of natural beekeeping and giving a really good name to how to do natural beekeeping in a really great way. Um, so highly recommend him. I think that's pretty much all I have for resources. Oh, and then um, here's that link to the Santa Cruz Bees Beekeepers Guild group. And then again, a link to my company so you guys can keep in touch. And I think that's all we've got. It's all she wrote. Well, and uh, for all those who are still here, we're going to be sending um, recordings of this so you can have it for review later. I feel like um, I don't keep these, but now I kind of want to. And uh, <laughs> but I'm also like more like I want to help somebody else who's already keeping these because there's so much knowledge and information to take. So um, yeah, if you could share some love for Emily in the chat before we wrap up here and um, on behalf of the Center for Agroecology, the Friends of the Farm and Garden, um, thank you all so much for attending. And, um, you know, there's there's a lot of good resources in here and material. And we encourage you, if you're, if you feel so inspired to come join us on Saturday up at the Farm and Garden, we'll be meeting at the Hay Barn. And um, yeah, there's more information on the link there. So um, thank you all so much for attending. And uh, Take care of those bees. And thank you again, Emily. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. It was a pleasure. All right. Good night, everybody. Great job. That was amazing.